I graduated high school just after the economic collapse of 2008. The meltdown was catastrophic in the state where I reside, so I went from living poor at home to living in a true poverty on my own. Myself and a friend got an apartment in downtown Phoenix. He worked in retail, and I worked security for a department store. We both made less than minimum wage, just barely enough to cover the bills together. The apartment complex that we lived in wasn't just a dump. It should have been condemned. Our unit had a bare concrete floor, unpainted plaster walls, and you could see light around the frame of the door. Fortunately, we lived in the valley, so temperatures weren't a huge issue, but security was pretty much non-existent. The place wasn't just trashy. It was a common occurrence to hear fights going on in the middle of the night, or to come home to a building totally taped off and police officers everywhere. I'd heard about a guy getting stabbed in the alley just a few streets over. He limped back to the complex and called for an ambulance. Another time, there was a late night dispute at a party and one guest ended up shooting another. To say it was a colorful apartment complex with lots of wild neighbors was just an understatement. This place was legitimately dangerous at all hours, for anyone from any walk of life. Even cops and gym rats were getting caught and beaten by street gangs and other violent offenders. We never really felt safe anywhere inside that neighborhood. I didn't even have a car to get around. I spent a lot of time walking or riding the bus wherein I did my best to lay low and not catch any attention. All that being said, I grew up in the city and spent my time going to late night metal and rap shows at sketchy venues. I knew how to navigate seedy areas, how to de-escalate situations, and ultimately, I had to handle myself. I'd been in more than one physical altercation and always managed to walk away. My roommate and I were both potheads, so naturally we came up with the idea of selling weed on the side for extra money. We both already worked full time, to the point of extra hours every week, and would still come up short every month. In our heads, the logical move was to sell weed that we always had a stash of in the house. The idea was, we'd both be able to smoke for free and maybe kick up a little profit here and there. So that's what we did. We started with a half a pound invested an entire month's rent to get it, and started flipping it immediately. We kept it real low profile, under the radar at all cost, because we did not have the means to protect this stash. Our front door barely even locked for Christ's sake. We definitely couldn't afford a gun. Frankly, I don't even think we wanted one. We never discussed the possibility of getting robbed or anything like that. This was just a side gig to make a little cash, not anything we wanted to get wrapped up in. By that logic, the only people we sold to were direct friends and family, co-workers, people we could trust, and hold accountable for anything that went awry. We weren't really huge party guys, maybe the occasional weekend turnout, but we mostly just chilled at home. We liked getting stoned and playing video games, watching movies, vaguely nerdy stuff. So this is what happened. I have to tell you in two parts because I wasn't there for the first half. I'd gone to work at my normal shift, but ended up having to stay late due to filing some last minute reports. While I was at work, my roommate, who we'll call Mike, got home and did his normal thing, put on a pair of basketball shorts, grabbed a Pepsi from the fridge, and saddled up to the TV after smoking some weed. He'd play some solo campaign or whatever until I got home. Then we'd get online and team play or something. It was normal routine for our work week. Right around the time I was supposed to get home, the door handle jiggled. Mike didn't think anything of it. It jiggled a second time. This time my roommate hopped up and went to the door and actually opened it. Instead of finding me, he found a squad of gangbangers who pushed their way inside. Mike couldn't even scream before a hand is slapped over his mouth. He's ushered into the kitchen and then laid on the floor. At this point, I'm starting to wrap up my extra shift at work. I'm getting close to clocking out. There's a 40 minute bus ride between me and the break in going on at my house. Either way, we don't even know that it's happening, so it's not like I'm about to call the cops or get our buddies together. I just finish up and head to the bus stop like I normally did. Meanwhile, Mike is getting jammed up badly. Three of these are holding him down, slapping the absolute hell out of him, demanding to know where all the valuables are. Behind them, the fourth guy is already starting to root around the living room. 
He's put our PS3, games, and controllers into a pillowcase. He's sizing up the flat screen, deciding if it's worth the trouble. Mike decides in this moment, he's not going to go down without a fight. He struggles, shoves, spits, but it's no use. It just gets him in deeper water. A couple of these guys ring his bell, almost break his nose. The punches are so hard that his head is bouncing off the exposed concrete flooring. But still, Mike isn't out. His muscles flex against these guys out of instinct, not having any more in him. Two of them roll my roommate over, while the third ties his hands and feet with a pair of bootlaces. They were organized, well-practiced, and methodical, and Mike knew he was outgunned. But for whatever reason, he still did not want to give up. He starts shouting for the neighbors to call the cops, call anybody, he's being robbed. One of the guys comes back and stuffs his own sock into the back of his throat, before going back to turning the place upside down. By now, I'm just getting off the bus, and I've started a short walk to the apartment. I've taken my headphones out because I don't want to stroll with music through the neighborhood. It just seems like the easiest way to get jumped. I avoid the alleyway shortcuts and just wander the main roads, which is the longest way. All the while Mike is getting his head bounced off the floor. I've always felt bad for the leisurely manner in which I went home. I enter the complex, make it to my building, ascend the exterior staircase to the second floor. I can see our unit. The door is closed, but behind the thin curtains of our front window, I can see two or three bodies hustling around. There is noise, but it's nothing that seems totally crazy. My first thought is to knock, but then I dismiss that immediately. It might be a shithole, but my name is on the lease. I twist the door handle. It's locked. I slip in the key and push open the door. Three big, shadowy ski mask goons turn to look at me. My first instinct is to bolt. It's as clear as day we're getting robbed. I don't even make it two feet before I feel a pair of hands snatch me up and then yank me back into the fluorescent hellscape that I call a home. The tour was horrific. Our TV is smashed to shit. The electronics have all been bagged up. Papers and mail scattered everywhere. Everything in the kitchen is on the floor. I remember all the silverware and broken glass just being shiny. I couldn't look away as they carried me down the hall. The hallway is like a bomb crater, holes punched in the drywall, clothes and random stuff scattered everywhere. I didn't resist as much as Mike did, so I just got hauled into the back bedroom, where I found my roommate face down. They'd hogtied him, he's thrashing like a crazy person against the bindings. I can see his wrist and ankles rub raw and are starting to bleed. They throw me on the ground next to him and roll me over. My hands get tied in a similar manner, but I guess they ran out of cord because they never bound my feet. They get me laced up and return to searching the place, but with what looks like a quickness. I got the vibe they weren't expecting me to just show up and now figured anything could happen, even cop interference. Mike turns to me, spits the sopping wet sock out of his mouth. He'd apparently been working on it for a while but didn't have a reason as to they probably just stuff it back in. We're in his bedroom. It's already been ransacked. His video games are gone. Signed concert posters, even his mattress was flipped over. We gotta get these guys, is all he says to me. I shake my head. How the hell are we gonna do that? We need to call the cops. Mike nods to my laces and asks me if I can get free. Cautiously, I start to work the lace binding my wrist together. I'm staring down the hall, waiting for a shadow, any sign of someone coming back. I assume if they catch me trying to get out of the knot, it'll result in a savage beating, like they did on Mike. I don't want any part of that. I'm not a hero. I just want the situation to end as quickly as possible. But I do find that my knot is loose. After picking at it for only a minute, the whole thing unravels and I push myself to my feet. The adrenaline dump hits me. I fly over to Mike and start undoing his knots. These are much more tight and intricate. They take me much longer to pick at. It felt like almost an hour, but was probably closer to 10 minutes. Mike just laid there, still as could be, slowly clenching and unclenching his fists. Surprisingly, no one ever came to check on us, 
we could still hear them rooting around the living room and my bedroom. And the weirdest part, I didn't even care. None of it mattered when I looked at the blood dripping from Mike's mouth and nose or the rapidly bruising flesh around his eyes. There's a part about Mike that I've left out. He was a little older than me. He'd actually served in the army. He was a combat vet who'd been deployed to Afghanistan a year or two prior while I was still in school. He was a bit of a wild card as he struggled with PTSD after coming home. Now, he was a combat crawling across the ravaged cement of his bedroom. It was totally crazy to watch as he disappeared into the folding doors of his closet, then reemerged with a baseball bat and an old military helmet on his head, a green steel one like from World War II. The only thing he had on was one sock and those goddamn basketball shorts that he'd wear every day after work. I waited in the bedroom out of pure fear before finally glancing down the hall. It looked like the place had cleared out, except for Mike, who was stalking through the shadows with a bat lifted over his head, staring at something. Sure enough, one of the robbers steps out from the kitchen and into the hall, moving left to right. The front door is in front of him, maybe 10 feet or so, and Mike is closing in, mere steps away. The guy's back is to us. He's rummaging through a box of our stuff. Mike clocks the guy over the back of the head, and somehow, this guy weathers the blow. I mean, it was a full body blow to the back of the cranium with a steel bat. It was unbelievable to watch. The guy stumbles forward and then starts to recover. Before he can yell though and warn his buddies, Mike peels his helmet off and pitches it. This piece of steel hits the guy in the head, full tilt. He starches and then falls limp against the cement floor. Mike turns around and points at me, tells me to come sit on the guy he just knocked out cold. I was petrified, but slowly under Mike's encouragement, I crept out and put a knee on the guy's back. It didn't matter though, he was literally snoring on the ground. Mike tells me to check the guy for a cell phone, and if I could find one, call the police. Before I can reply, my roommate re-equips his helmet and charges out into the night after the remaining bandits. I turn back to the guy that's underneath me and shakily check his pockets. Lo and behold, I find a phone, two of them, mine and Mike's. He's also got our wallets and a little cash, which I pocket all of. I call the cops and let them know what's going on, and they actually arrive pretty quickly, well before the guy wakes up. As I said earlier, this apartment complex that we lived in was notorious for all kinds of crazy criminal activity. There was a squad car hovering around at all hours, it seemed. Mike returned just as they were loading the single guy into the car and taking a statement from me. Our apartment was absolutely destroyed, so everything was pretty obvious, and I could actually point out the evidence to corroborate the story. They found all our weed and smoking material and stole all of it, so fortunately, we didn't have to worry about catching any charges. We also failed to mention the extent to which Mike beat that guy. He didn't find any of the other men. They were loading our stuff into a getaway car the whole time, so when they were done, they were gone fast. They never caught them, and we never got our stuff back. And we weren't even able to move out of the complex as quickly as we wanted to. We did invest in a stronger door, a better lock, and always made sure to check before we unlocked it for anyone. We also stopped selling weed. As near as we could tell, those guys had heard from someone that we were a plug so they decided to roll us. I like to sleep in. It's the number one thing that I look forward to on my days off. One morning, I was doing exactly that, just rolling around in bed, first sleeping past the time that I usually got up for work and then past the hour I typically eat breakfast. I don't really set a time for when I want to wake up, I just keep turning over until I decide I'm ready. I guess it would have been a bit after 7am when I got this weird feeling. I don't know how to describe it other than a low sense of anxiety. I felt like something is wrong. I chalked it up to work stress, like maybe I'd left something undone, I'm just trying to get my sleep in. Not long after this, I hear my cat ripping up the stairs and down the hallway. I turn over just in time to see him, jump and sail through the air, and nimbly land on the top side cover of the bed. 
He quickly nudges his way underneath the blankets and hides near my feet. All of this is very out of character for him. Firstly, my cat is elderly and very overweight. Running anywhere is strange, but jumping and scrambling is totally bizarre. And hiding. This is a stereotypical cat, but he doesn't really cuddle, let alone get underneath the blankets with me. Now I'm much more alert, and I'm starting to think that that feeling earlier was a premonition of some kind. Maybe the feeling of being watched. Whatever the case, I take a deep breath and decide it's time to get up and investigate the house. Just as I get halfway upright, I make out the form of two men slinking up my stairs. They're dressed all in black, looking right at me. The whole exchange made me feel like I was supposed to feel intimidated and for whatever reason, it just really pissed me off. Probably because I worked hard for my stuff and these two clowns were going to rob me of some of it. At that moment, I felt like time stopped. There's no really other way to describe it besides total limbo. It felt like those dreams we have for whatever reason, where something bad is happening around you but you're powerless to escape or act. Suddenly everything is in slow motion, as if trying to move underwater, and all your strength fails you. It was sickening in the moment, but it was my house. No one else was going to do anything but me. I snapped out of my trance and started to move. This gave time opposite the sensation, like everything was in fast forward now. I threw the covers back and leapt out of bed. I remember I made sure to land heavy on my feet. I wanted to shake the entire house, really let them know how this was going to go. I remember making sure to wrap my cat up in the covers, make sure he was secure before I started my war cry. I don't remember exactly how it went, but it was something to the effect of, get the fuck out of my house, over and over and over again at the top of my lungs. They froze in place as all this happened. I crashed through the doorway and into the hall. They turned and bolted for the door, and that fanned that inner rage I was feeling, that primal urge to protect my cave from these invaders. My mission quickly shifted from defense to offense, and I sprang after these guys. As I was screaming, my voice seemed to get deeper and deeper. I thought I sounded like my dad or my grandpa. It was such a weird thought to have at the time, but those were the people that I'd seen in their angriest, and they sounded a lot like me right then. I think it motivated me, because the next thing I knew, I was soaring down my staircase like a missile. There was a bend in the staircase, and one of these wannabe robbers was just shuffling around it when I jumped. I crashed into him. We both slammed into the adjacent wall. In this guy's defense, he fought his way free pretty quickly. Then we collided with the hardwood of the wall. I fractured my arm in two places. My grasp on him suffered greatly, as you can imagine. That didn't stop me though. I kept after them through the front door, which had been opened with a crowbar or some kind of tool. The entire door frame was chewed up from the effort, and my bare feet were assaulted by the splintered wood as I ran over it. They stabbed me all over, including underneath my toenails. I didn't even realize how bad they were injured until a few hours after the break-in. Adrenaline is a crazy thing. We all get outside and these guys are sprinting. They have the proper shoes on. It isn't long before they leave me in their dust. Still, I'm huffing it. I see the getaway car. They both jump in the back and this thing peels out, but not before I see the seven digit license plate and whip around the corner. I stood there, aching arm and throbbing feet, and just repeated it out loud over and over again to myself. I think subconsciously I was hoping a neighbor would come out to assist, but, but no one was home evidently. By the time I made it home, I'd forgotten the license plate number. I was furious, but there was nothing I could do. If I'd brought my phone, I could have saved it and locked those guys up for a couple of months at the very least. Justice, from my point of view, was never served. They didn't steal anything, only scaring me and my cat half to death. But they did bust my arm up, and that wasn't convenient. The sense of adrenaline and the fight or flight response is almost indescribable. It's so overwhelming, it's like your only sense for a moment. I'd become hyper-focused on a certain detail, but obviously things would completely escape me, like my ripped up feet. The time dilation was something to behold. When I made my report, I was told that the area was ripe with break-ins. Several other houses had been hit in similar manners. I went out and invested in a full home security system, complete with a camera on every door and corner. 
full hard drive and cloud storage, the whole shebang. I even started taking shooting classes because whereas I kept a gun in the house, I wasn't confident enough to run and grab it while being robbed. Our world is so crazy. So everyone, stay vigilant out there. When I was younger, I was in a relationship with a guy that we'll call Jay. He and I were very unstable, but we were totally in love and had been through a lot in the years together. We struggled with a lot of things, even teetered on being homeless. But Jay pulled through and got us a place to stay for a while. Things were tight, but it seemed like we were going to be able to manage for at least a little while. Jay and I were staying with two of his friends, Tim and Derek. Derek had left the apartment an hour or so before Jay and I decided to head to bed. This really wasn't that uncommon, as both of Jay's friends were into all kinds of weird scenes. They were both big party guys, loved to drink. But one of them liked to gamble and the other was into drugs. I don't remember which one was which, but it made for an uncomfortable situation at home. A few minutes after Jay fell asleep, I heard a knock at the door, and Tim answered it. It turned out it was Derek, but he wasn't alone. Two guys that also lived in the apartment building forced Derek to knock at the door, so that they could force their way in, as he didn't have his keys with them. Once they were inside, I could hear what sounded like a scuffle from where I was in the bedroom with the door closed. I woke Jay up, and all of a sudden, we hear two unknown voices yelling, Get down! Get the fuck on the ground! The energy just escalated from there, as Tim and Derek shouted back, and then there was more of a scuffle. It sounded more one-sided this time. Jay wanted to go see what was going on, but I begged him to stay in the bedroom with me, which thankfully, he did. After what seems like a couple of minutes of arguing and fighting, everything went absolutely silent. It's maddening to be in a situation like that, especially inside your own home. Everything you take for granted just flies out the window. You're left with whatever chaos is left waiting for you. There wasn't a door or a lock that could keep us safe, based on what we were hearing. Jay persisted that we needed to make sure that his friends were okay, and at this point, I didn't know what to do. The silence was just eerie as hell. We opened up the bedroom door, didn't see anything. So we slowly crept down the hall until we saw a pair of legs sprawled out across the living room floor. Blood was starting to pool beneath the torso. It was Tim. He was struggling to breathe. There was something sticking out of his chest. It looked like a spear or a sword to me. Later, the police would tell me it was a barbed machete. Derek was frantically calling 911. He was almost incoherent, trying to make his report. Caught between speaking to dispatch and trying to keep his friend awake. Jay went mental at the sight of his friend. He tore the bathroom apart looking for medical supplies, but ultimately, just came back with lots of towels and adhesive wraps. He tried to staunch the bleeding, but the wound was crazy. It was like something out of a movie. Tim needed an ambulance immediately. Derek told us the police were on their way, but didn't have a time of arrival. What were we supposed to do? My first initial thought was that I needed to get the hell out of here. But Derek stopped me. He said dispatch said because of the nature of the call, everyone needed to remain in the residence until the police arrived and could start their own investigation. I had to stay in the apartment with a guy I barely knew, bleeding out, gasping for help. It was horrendous. I wish there was more that we could have done. Soon, we could hear sirens cutting through town. One at first, then a couple more joined the choir. They were a little more different from each other, so I assumed one was an ambulance and the other two were police. I realized the guy that did this could still be around. It also occurred to me, they might hear the sirens and come back to finish everyone off. We were all witnesses, technically. The apartment building didn't have buzzers to let anyone into the building, so when the police got there, Jay let them in and showed them to where our suite was. After that, they separated us all and put three of us into the back of three different police cars. They left us while the paramedics tried to save Tim. Unfortunately, they weren't able to save him, and he died inside the apartment. I knew he was dead when the paramedics wheeled him out to the ambulance, but didn't leave for at least another five minutes without working on him at all. He just sat back there on the stretcher, shapeless under the blanket they draped over him. 
blood slowly starting to spot through the fabric. I couldn't do anything but cry as I watched them drive away. The police took us to be questioned, again keeping us separated the entire time. About 12 hours later, they were ready to let us go, but told us we were not allowed to go back to our apartment as it was an active crime scene. We were dropped off by the police at a coffee shop with no money, no phone or wallets, or even shoes on our feet, as they wouldn't let us take anything from the apartment before they put us in the police cars before being questioned earlier. We ended up going to a friend's house where we stayed until we were let back into our apartment four or five days later. The whole thing was dehumanizing, being separated because we were all essentially suspects into the killing, not able to support one another just in case we were covering somebody. All the time we spent sheltered at the friend's house was just a fog, a complete haze. We all really wanted to talk about what happened, but no one really knew how. Jay and Derek would whisper about it sometimes, especially if I was elsewhere in the house. This was because I would get so emotional at the thought of everything, pretty much lose my mind. Once we were allowed back into the apartment, the first thing I had to do was clean up the blood, which I'm sure you can imagine was pretty hard to handle. There seemed to be gallons of it pooled in the same spot, just coagulated endless blood, and I'll never ever forget that smell. Obviously this isn't protocol, but the police don't clean up crime scenes. They give you a card to someone who does, and the charge is thousands of dollars. We could barely afford rent, so that wasn't even an option for us. We just took shifts sopping up the blood and wringing into a bucket. The whole thing was pretty traumatic. After graduating, I got into a bit of a situation with a guy that I knew from school. He and I weren't friends, but we had a few classes together, so we were familiar naturally. Well, for whatever reason, after we both graduated, this guy started coming to my job pretty regularly. I worked at a restaurant. It wasn't entirely out of ordinary at first, but after a while, I really started to get this weird feeling. It started with the staring. He would eyeball me from one end of the building to the other looking me up and down without so much as a blink. It was weird, but soon other people started to comment on it, and that's when I really got creeped out. I realized how little I actually knew this guy. Then after that came the text. He'd harass me every hour of the day. Fortunately, this didn't go on for far too long as I was wise enough to just block him. I really didn't want to entertain any part of his crazy, so that was enabling him in my mind. I just needed to be shut down on the spot, and by doing that, I hoped to shut it down entirely. It didn't go the way I hoped it would, though. Soon this guy was showing up at house parties that I attended, lurking along the fringes like a true weirdo. I gave him a polite hello at first, but he just stared. Sometimes he'd nod his head, gesturing like he wanted us to get out of here and go somewhere else. It wasn't until he showed up at three or four of these house parties in a row that it occurred to me how strange it really truly was. I had a lot of friends. What were the odds he knew this many of them? I asked the girl hosting if she knew him. Her answer was no. She'd never seen him before. And she definitely didn't invite him. Okay, the plot thickens. How the hell did this guy know how to find me? Over the next few days, I pieced it all together. He was following me from work my house and he figured out my entire schedule. That was my best guess and really the only thing that made any sense. Well, the guy who was stalking me broke into my house with his friend. I had messed up my sleep schedule so I was awake at 3 or 4 a.m. I grabbed my little dog and phone and went to the basement. It was this little cellar almost. A trap door in the floor with stairs that led down to a small space with a furnace and hot water tank. The second that I sealed myself down there, I regretted my decision. I really didn't know how dangerous these guys were, and I just cornered myself with absolutely no way out. If they found me, I was completely at their disposal. I'd put a lot of faith in my cleverness and their lack of awareness. Bit of a gamble, but I didn't know what else to do. Thankfully, my dog is nice and well-mannered and a little baby, so she didn't make a noise the entire time. I was worried that she'd bark or growl and give up our hiding space. I'd had some cardboard on the top of my door, 
so they didn't see it when it was closed. I turned my phone on silent and texted my best friend asking her to call the police for me. Meanwhile, I can hear these two skulking around from room to room, trying to surround me. They figured that I was in my room when they entered, and you can almost hear the surprise in their footfalls. They came to a stop and just stood there, almost directly above me. After the longest 15 minutes of my life, the cops eventually get there. They arrested the shithead and his buddy, and then came to find me. These two assholes had what police described to me as a rape and disposal kit. Duct tape, lube, sex toys, a handsaw, and a box of heavy-duty big black trash bags, which implied intent and planning. They went away for conspiracy to murder, conspiracy to commit rape, breaking and entering, and something else that I can't remember. The guy who actually stalked me tried to pin it all on his buddy, so his buddy ended up going away for five years and is still in prison. While my stalker served three of his four-year sentence, he threw his buddy under the bus and took a plea deal for himself and later got out on good behavior. I got a restraining order, which he violated a couple of times right away. It had been quiet for a bit until he got a girlfriend a couple of years ago. He told her his version in which he was the victim and I was the villain who sent him to jail for nothing. She sent me this long, nasty message telling me she'd find me and make me pay for it. So predictably, the cops got to go talk to both of them. But thankfully, I haven't heard from either since. For some reason, a few hours leading up to this event, I was feeling uneasy and on edge. This was three hours prior, and I even consciously thought it was weird because I had a buddy over who was playing my favorite video game. I just couldn't enjoy myself. Unusually, my father was also up very late watching TV in the lounge, and he too later commented he felt like he was being watched. Approximately an hour after he turned into bed, everything happened all at once. We believe at least three men tried to quietly pull a window out of our double doors to get in, but they dropped the pane and when it shattered, everyone was alerted. Shouting, barking, and screaming commenced and they tried to break the door down and get in, grab anything convenient. Unfortunately for them, we had a large bird cage blocking the door on the inside and they couldn't get in. They decided to make their getaway and while doing so, one of them threw a brick at the window my father was looking through and broke that pane as well. While this is all going down, my buddy and I stayed inside my room, door shut and locked. I grabbed a nearby skateboard, the only thing I had that could be weaponized. It felt like everything was happening very slowly, especially because I could hear but not see what was going on. For reference, we have a freestanding house that at the time had an empty plot next door. We think they jumped over the concrete wall as there's a palisade fencing in front of our house. Once the brick came through the window, all hell broke loose. My father interpreted this as an act of frustration because we caught them coming in. He took to screaming profanities at the shattered window while getting himself together. Light coat, shoes, belt, everything he might need to give chase to the neighborhood. The last thing that he grabbed was the taser and a flashlight from the drawer in the kitchen. I'll never forget his voice as he shouted through the house for us to call the police and slammed the front door behind him. The rest of the family started to come out of wherever we were all hiding. Me and my friend, my mom and sister, even the dog came together. My mom dialed the police while the rest of us started cleaning up the glass and finding a piece of cardboard to tape over the window. Anything to provide some kind of security through the night, even if it was just tape. As we're sweeping and talking, I can hear my mother's voice taper off into the silence. It sounded strange to me, so I decided to poke my head into the kitchen and see what was up. I assumed she was getting special instructions or information from the dispatcher. That's why she wasn't talking. What I find instead is my mother standing on one side of the kitchen and a man in a black mask standing on the other side. He's holding a large knife out before him. His other palm is open and face up beside it. The gesture says, give me everything valuable and do it rather quickly. I'm not exactly sure if this was part of their plan, but after they broke the window, and saw my father was going to chase them. One of them circled back and snuck in. This guy wasn't going through all this trouble without a payout. My mother was slowly unclasping her necklace when I looked in. 
My first reaction was to go to war with this guy, but I looked down at the flimsy broom in my hand and knew I was outgunned. He was much older than me, larger than me, even with my mom. We probably didn't stand a chance. She slid her necklace across the counter and waited. He pocketed the necklace but doesn't leave. He's looking us both up and down, scanning the kitchen for anything else shiny or made of money. My mom is careful to hide her hand so he doesn't see her wedding ring. And that's when I notice the phone still sitting on the counter. I can hear the tiny faraway voice of the dispatcher asking if she was still there. I picked up the phone and said yes, we're still here. The men have returned to our house. I say this into the receiver just as I make eye contact with the guy across the kitchen. I could see that he was in shock, the sheer disbelief unfolding in his eyes. He was panicking, must not have thought we had any courage to make any kind of stand. The dispatcher told us to get as far away as possible and help was on the way. By now, my friend and my sister have realized that something weird is still going on. They step into the kitchen from the living room and discover the situation. Even though we're all young and unarmed, half of us women, there's a sense of power now that all four of us stood together. All of the confidence the burglar had drained out. He took slow, unsure steps back toward the exit. Across the villa, we could hear the first chirps of a siren. Help really was on the way, and this emboldened us even further. Who was this man to enter our home and demand our valuables? Like my father at the window, I was suddenly overcome with personal rage that needed to be expressed accordingly. Without any thought, I lifted the broom over my head and charged at the man. I cracked him over the head a few times before he tried to get away. By then, my mom and sister were both shouting and throwing plates, which were also hitting him all over. He managed to get out of the house, only to encounter my father in the front yard. He just returned from chasing the rest of the robbers up and down the lane, tasing them when they were in reach. The majority of the crew was arrested that night. My mother reunited with her necklace. I've never had any braver moment to this day. If only I'd had that skateboard instead of that broom. I lived with a couple of friends when I was younger. We rented a property on the edge of town where the hustle and bustle wasn't as crazy. There was still traffic and commerce, but nothing like you'd seen in the heart of town. It had its pros and its cons. One of those cons was the weird foot traffic that you could encounter. Because we lived on what was considered the outskirts, lots of strange people could usually be seen walking around. If a new hobo was coming to town or one of the old ones was leaving, they'd wander through the neighborhoods like mine on the way through. Because our area wasn't as busy, these folks just really stuck out. One day we were relaxing at home. We noticed a man stroll by our house a number of times. We didn't think anything of it at first, but then my roommate's sister pointed out he'd walk by four or five times and was always staring at the house while he did so. We found that strange, so we kept an eye on him, but after that, we really didn't see him again. As the day went on, it got a little warmer. Being cheap kids without a whole lot of disposable income, we elected to open up the doors and windows rather than turn on the AC. It was a nice day, not a cloud in sight, so getting all that fresh air throughout the house sounded like a good idea to all of us. The house had a front and a back door, regular box windows along the side. The front of the house, though, was adorned with these three massive windows that exposed all of the front rooms. They allowed tons of natural light and airflow when they were open, but obviously were a bit of a security issue at night. People could see into the house from the street if the blinds weren't closed. We'd never really had any problems, but it was definitely something that we noticed after coming home late a few times. Well, that weirdo that had been walking up and down the street earlier took our open doors and windows as a personal invitation. It was the middle of the day. I was in my bedroom getting some work done. My roommate and his sister were chilling in the living room. We'll call them Ben and Candy. They said they watched as this guy peeled off the street and walked right up to the first big window. He cupped his hands and looked through, then moved to the second window and did the same until he saw them sitting there. He then gave the creepiest smile of all time a small wave, and then proceeded to enter the house. So he knew clear as day someone was home. He'd even walked the property multiple times, at all the indicators of someone casing the place. 
My roommate just assumed he needed help at first, but after that creepy smile, he knew something was off. He assumed it was a mental illness or some kind of psychosis. Ben confronts the guy at the door, tells him that he needs to leave right now. As the conversation goes on, Ben quickly figures out that this guy isn't confused and isn't having a mental crisis of any kind. He deliberately approached the house and entered. Now the conversation turns eerie as the stranger in the door starts talking crazy. Ben heard the gibberish and just made a snap decision. This guy was already in the house and teetering on dangerous. He has no intent on leaving but was now just talking about robbing and hurting people, making threats essentially. Ben shouted two things. He called for me to come out from the back and then called for his sister to get his gun from the bedroom. Before the guy can make a move, Ben springs into a full-on sprint and tackles this guy into the doorframe, so hard that it cracked the wood. Hearing all this crazy commotion, as well as the yelling, I exit my room just in time to see the stranger give Ben a couple of serious blows to the back of the head. This guy's elbow is cracking my roommate in the jaw and the neck, and that's all I needed to see to jump into action. After I get involved, Ben and I manage to wrestle the guy to the floor and pin him there. Candy emerges from the back room carrying a big black 45 and then passes it to Ben. The guy sees the gun and immediately calms down, says we can talk about it. It's crazy just how much a weapon can change a situation. Ben nods and racks around and presses the barrel to the guy's neck and tells him to stop moving. The stranger complies. Both Ben and I back off and disentangle ourselves from the fray. We back up 10 or 12 feet spread out just in case we have to rush him again. Andy grabbed the phone and had dialed 911. He's now putting a report in to dispatch. The stranger does not like what he's hearing. He goes back to crazy talk, saying things like, I thought we were going to talk this out. Why are you calling the cops? He goes ballistic again, but Ben isn't entertaining any of it. He's clearly pointing a gun at this guy's chest and telling him not to move. It doesn't matter. This guy is already committing to freaking out starts going mental, pushing furniture over, throwing stuff at Ben. Just as the guy is pacing back and forth, flexing, yelling, he suddenly turns to Ben with this crazy look, reaches into his pocket, and starts to charge. Ben doesn't hesitate, simply pulls the trigger until it clicks, sending every round sailing into this guy's torso. I froze out of fear and pure shock. I knew Ben had just killed this guy. Fortunately, the police arrive and immediately clear the situation. Ben is stripped of his gun and given a medical check, then placed in the back of a squad car. Candy and I are questioned, but ultimately allowed to remain in the house. We start the process of crime scene cleanup and removal and went to our family's homes until all of that was done. The shooting was ruled self-defense and roommate got cleared. It was a long, tedious process, as it should be and he never got his gun back. There were times I thought he was gonna be locked up forever, but the system ultimately did its job for once. The fact that there were so many witnesses to corroborate everything really helped him out. I believe the guy was found to be heavily under the influence, but I'm not sure of what. If I had to guess, I would say meth or PCP, based on what I've read and the way he was acting. His eyes were just crazy, and that back and forth aggression was just beyond unpredictable. Since he's dead, I guess no one will ever really know what his issue was. My roommate ended up struggling heavily with PTSD from this event, as well as follow-on events that happened inside the military. This was a couple of weeks before my 19th birthday. I woke up one morning, around 4 a.m., while someone was trying to break down my bedroom door. I'd fallen asleep with my light on after coming in tired from work. When they came to my room, I could at least see what was happening. Not that it helped much at first. There were two guys, and one of them immediately attacked me with a hammer. I just told them to take whatever they wanted. The other guy started to load all my electronics into a backpack. My family lived inside a poor neighborhood, so crime like this wasn't exactly uncommon. Still. This had never happened directly to us. We're a kind, honest family. No history of crime or anything like that. We'd lock our doors at night, that type of thing. Still, anyone can be targeted, as this story is evidence of. 
I think this gang of thieves targeted us because of my weird late hours of work. I'd come home sometimes in the middle of the night, the only person wandering down my street. I'm sure they built a loose schedule of my day and planned the robbery appropriately. Meanwhile, my mother down the hall had woken up with a commotion, started shouting to know what was going on. Thank God that she did this from the safety of her own bedroom. The next moment though, they both ran out of my room and shut the door on the way out. They were now headed for my mother's room. She managed to hold the door closed on them for a few seconds, giving me time to open up the safe in my cupboard. It required a six digit key code that somehow I managed to input correctly. Despite my shaking fingers, inside laid a 380 handgun, an heirloom from my grandpa. I checked for a round in the chamber and went to open up the door and make my way to my mother's room. A 380 isn't exactly ideal for personal defense situations, but these guys were clearly poor too and definitely didn't have a gun. I figured the second I brandished it, they'd be on the run, and if I pulled the trigger, they'd surrender for sure. Boy, was I wrong. I opened up the door and one of the guys turned around and ran at me with a hammer. I fired two shots before he could get to me and pushed me back into my room. He wrestled me on my bed where he tried to take my pistol. Meanwhile, the other guy started to cut my arm and head with what turned out to be one of my mother's own kitchen knives. My mother eventually joined the fray and managed to take the knife away from the guy cutting me. I was just holding onto the pistol with everything I had into me because I knew that if one of them got control of the firearm, my mother and I would be dead. It's just a crazy feeling, not being able to protect my head and face from an actual blade. Just watching this shiny steel dip into my flesh, coming away covered in more and more blood. My mother froze after she took the knife away, and the guy got up. He sprang to his feet, grabbed my DVD player, and knocked my TV to the ground. I didn't know what he was doing until he bashed me in the head with it. By this time, I managed to sort of wrestle my gun hand free and shouted to my mother to get out of the way for me to try to get off another shot. She rolled off the bed. I managed to turn the gun enough to get a shot off into the guy on top of me. It was then that they decided to finally bolt and grab my bag of electronics on the way out. When the cops came, they found a body with two gunshot wounds in my garden just a few meters away from the house and a blood trail leading away to where it disappeared onto a nearby road. The second guy was never caught, and I was cleared of any wrongdoing, despite killing one of them. I even got to keep my gun, as the laws here in my country differ from most of the others. The entire situation was surreal. The amount of blood in my bedroom was perhaps the most unbelievable, though. Between the knife and the hammer and the gun, myself and those two perps must have lost several courts. When I fired that last round into the guy on top of me, the amount of gore that poured out of him sent me into shock. It was like I turned a faucet on that was tapped into his insides. I will say this though, movies, TV, they really don't get gunfights accurate. I thought those guys would run the second they saw my gun. Instead they attacked me without any hesitation. I even shot the first attacker and he still managed to push me back into my bedroom and onto my head despite having a bullet wound. His adrenaline must have actually made him stronger than me. What I learned from this whole ordeal is that you can never be too safe, especially if you have a family to protect. Back in 1997, a man named Osil Gillian took control of Mexico's Gulf Cartel following the arrest of the organization's leader. The powerful vacuum left behind by his predecessor's capture sparked a violent turf war in which rival cartels faced off against each other as the Mexican military tried in vain to keep the peace. As the conflict raged on, the Gulf Cartel began to suffer heavy losses to both men and material, and for a while, they were dangerously close to being overwhelmed and annihilated. But luckily, Asiel had an ace up his sleeve, and that ace was named Arturo Guzman de Sina. De Sina was born into a poor working class family in the Mexican city of Puebla on January 13th of 1976. Like many of his peers, de Sina realized that his best chance at escaping economic hardship was to join the military, 
so on his 16th birthday, he volunteered to join the Mexican army. The Cena proved to be a talented soldier, so talented in fact, that he was chosen to undergo selection for an elite group of airborne special forces, known as the GAF for short. After joining the unit, the Cena received training in both the counterinsurgency tactics and the interdiction of narco traffickers. He first saw action during the 1994 Chiapas Uprising, in which more than 30 rebels were either killed or captured by DeSena's squadron. His unit received praise for the decisive victory over the rebels, but, but some noticed an exceedingly chilling detail in regarding the condition of the slain insurrectionists. Once they'd been killed, the shooting died down. The Sina and his men had apparently gathered up the bodies of the dead rebels and set about dissecting and mutilating their corpses. To his commanders, the desecration of the rebel bodies was something they could overlook due to the overall success of the operation. Yet, the Sina felt hideously underappreciated. Mexican special forces are paid slightly more than their regular army counterparts, but the amount still pales in comparison to what Decina believed he was worth. He became more and more bitter, watching his superiors rake in millions of pesos in bribe money, while he and his comrades lived off crumbs. Then one day, Decina received a home visit from two mysteriously well-dressed men. He was reportedly given 100,000 pesos, along with a piece of paper with the phone number written on it, and was told, if you're willing to work, there's plenty more where that came from. Less than 24 hours later, the Cena was setting up a secret meeting with his potential new employer, and when they met, he realized how they had all the money to burn. He was being sought out to head up the golf cartel's brand new military wing, one that would defend them from the incursions of both rival gangs and the Mexican authorities. At first, the Cena approached only his closest comrades in the GAF and put forward a very simple proposition. Join his new unit, enjoy bountiful compensation, and continue hunting narco-traffickers. The only catch was, they'd be doing so on behalf of the golf cartel. By that point, the Cena's former comrades were so jaded that working for the cartels seemed no different than working for the government. Both were morally bankrupt, but only one had the money to pay them what they actually deserved. It's also believed that since a huge political shift was occurring around this time, many Mexican Special Forces soldiers believed that they'd be held accountable for crimes that they committed during the cheapest uprising. And so, rather than risk having their service rewarded with prison time, they jumped ship and joined Decina in his brand new unit. Within just a few months, Decina had put together a group of 13 exceptionally well-trained and viciously ferocious killers, all of whom had served with him in the GAF. They organized themselves in the exact same manner as their formal special forces unit allowing for the lightning fast deployment of small but highly mobile teams of lightly armed but heavily motivated personnel. The Sina also employed the same military communication style as that was employed in the GAF, with members of the unit being referred to by only their call signs. In Mexico, the radio code for lower level federals was Y or Yankee, meaning individual officers would be referred to as Yankee 1 or Yankee 2, etc. But the higher ranking officers, those in charge of an entire city or county would be referred to by the code Z or Zeta. Seeing as he was the leader of this new paramilitary unit, the Sina was given the call sign Zeta 1, while second in command was referred to as Zeta 2. Soon, every member of the unit had a Zeta call sign, which in turn gave rise to the names they're known by today, Los Zetas. At first, the Zetas focused exclusively on helping Asiel consolidate his position as head of the Gulf Cartel, and they did so with surgical efficiency. They castrated his rivals, skinned his enemies alive, struck fear into the hearts of all who might challenge the cartel's dominance. As their victories mounted, so did their membership, as dozens of corrupt police officers and disgruntled special forces soldiers, and even had a handful of former U.S. Army personnel sought to join their ranks. Yet the Zetas didn't allow just anyone into their organization. Applicants were required to possess a certain level of fitness and weapons training, and of those who didn't impress the original 13 Zetas, they were subjected to extreme physiological torture to determine if they really had what it takes. Those who passed were welcome into a brotherhood, 
told they were mentally and physically superior to other men, and that wealth and prominence were theirs to be won by bloodshed. Over the decade that followed, and despite dozens of their numbers being arrested or killed, the Lasetas grew more and more powerful. By the year 2010, they both outnumbered and outclassed their parent organization, and after fearing that their pet monster had become way too big to control, the cartel decided the Zetas needed a reminder of who was actually in charge. The situation came to a head when Cartel Lieutenant Samuel Borrego was shot by a Zeta member after an argument over a drug trafficking corridor. The cartel demanded that the Zetas hand over the man's killer. Their response was to declare war. The Gulf Cartel were almost completely unprepared for what followed. After several of their top figures were assassinated by a crack team of Zeta operators, the cartel deployed hundreds of their foot soldiers to the border towns northern of Tamaulipas. The vehicles they drove were marked with acronyms and insignias such as CDG, Triple X, or M3, all of which denoted them as belonging to the Gulf Cartel, and they were armed to the teeth. But no matter how many gun trucks or machine pistol toting Sicarios they possessed, the cartel were in no position to weather the coming storm. Initially, the cartel deployed so many armed men to the streets of Reynosa that they believed the Zetas were afraid to face them. Daylight came and went. Not a shot was fired in anger. But as soon as the sun set, the Zetas began their offensive. Using the cloak of darkness to negate the tactical advantages afforded by the cartel's heavy machine guns, the Zeta operators used night vision goggles, silenced machine guns, to wreak havoc among the cartel's ranks. They sprang from the shadows at close quarters, executed well-hearsed room clearance drills, and by dawn, the city was awash with cartel blood. Following the capture of Reynosa, the city of Nuevo Laredo fell, and the border town of Matamoros, in turn. Entire cities were paralyzed by the violence, but in the end, the Zetas emerged victorious. By the summer of 2010, they controlled over 200 miles of the U.S.-Mexican border, all of which was crucial to the illegal narcotics trade. In desperation, the Gulf Cartel turned to their old rivals, the Sinaloa, and begged for their assistance. The cartel then split into two distinct groups, those of who wished to make peace with the Zetas for their own sake and their own survival, and those who wished to wipe them out. Many of those in the former group ended up joining with the Zetas, while those in the latter became a little more vassal for the Sinaloa and the Michelin cartels, who formed an alliance due to their mutual fear of the Zetas. Nowadays, the Gulf Cartel still technically exists, but it's never fully recovered following its not-so-civil conflict with the group it had a hand in creating. The capture of the northern Tamaulipas border corridor marked the end of the Zetas' first major battle with the Gulf Cartel. But the war was not yet over. What remained of the cartel had retreated south to lick their wounds, and the Zetas had yet to properly stamp their authority on the twin states of Tamaulipas and Nueve León. In order to assert complete control over the region's illegal activities, the Zetas' leadership decreed that all criminal enterprises owed them taxes, payable in either cash, material, or labor. Many of these groups complied with the order, but not all were so quick to pay tribute to their new overlord. Given its proximity to the Texan border, the state of Tamaulipas is home to dozens of criminal organizations who traffic in both narcotics and people. Many of these groups pledged fealty to Los Zetas and began handing over exorbitant sums in taxes, but others seemed to view the Zetas as beneath them and began to adopt identical tactics in an attempt to protect their own. In the city of San Fernando, gunmen aligned with the Gulf Cartel ambushed a group of Los Eta's operators, then strung their mutilated bodies from the streetlights. The Zeta's response was nothing short of barbaric. On the night of August 22, 2010, a convoy of 73 Central American migrants were passing through the Tamaulipas on their way to the United States border. When they reached the outskirts of San Fernando, they found a group of Zetas. They'd set up a roadblock, and after hijacking the migrants' vehicle at gunpoint, 
They then drove them out to a secluded ranch somewhere nearby. There, the migrants were forced out of their vehicles, marched into a warehouse, and told to kneel against a wall. One by one, they were shot execution style in the back of the head. Only one of the 72 migrants survived that execution when the bullet that was meant to kill him somehow passed through his jowl without severing any major blood vessels. This survivor then walked nearly 14 miles until he reached a checkpoint manned by Mexican Marines. At first, the authorities had their doubts regarding the survivor's story, but after a group of Marines were dispatched to the ranch, they confirmed that the story was in fact true. Authorities then asked that survivor to give them a complete account of his brief time in captivity. And this is what he told them. The 18-year-old Ecuadorian who called himself Luis had traveled from his home country of Honduras and had joined the migrant convoy once he reached Tamaulipas. Following their sudden kidnap, he and his fellow migrants were held overnight in what appeared to be an abandoned rural house prior to being transported to the ranch in the morning. Then, once they'd been forced inside that warehouse, each migrant was bound and blindfolded before shoved up against the wall. Lewis said a voice started calling out to them, telling them to lie down, be quiet, and not to scream. That's when the shooting started. Once everyone was dead, Lewis said he took off out of the warehouse, then walked all night until he saw the small light in the distance. There, on the outskirts of a small town, he found the roadblock manned by the Marines. When news of the massacre hit the headlines across Mexico, President Felipe Calderon sent his most profound condolences, the families of those affected, and said the murderers were the result of the war between the Zetas and the Gulf Cartel. Some speculated that the migrants were targeted because their traffickers were being financed by the Gulf Cartel, and killing them was the Zetas' way of choking off the cartel's profits. Whereas others have suggested that the first San Fernando massacre was merely a dry run for the horrors that would follow. Mexican Federal Highway 101 is the largest and most important transportation system in the state of Tamaulipas. It extends from the border city of Matamoros to the state capital of Ciudad Victoria. And around March of 2011, the locals began referring to it as the El Camino de la Muerte, or the Road of Death. Those who traveled along this highway between 2010 and 2011 used to see burned out vehicles, shot up trucks on the side of the road, dead bodies, often decapitated, that the cartels would leave behind. Others witnessed the Gulf Cartel's checkpoints installed from Padilla to San Fernando, in which served as an early warning system for many Los Zetas incursions to this area. Cadres of Los Zetas gunmen would sometimes drive into the area, mostly at night to terrorize just about anyone that they come across. They would rob people, kill people, violate the women. Then at one point, Los Zetas started stealing entire busloads of innocent people. One driver claimed that after a masked gunman forced him to stop, 12 of his passengers were pulled off and forced into a separate vehicle at gunpoint. One witness stated that the gunman would point at certain passengers, all of whom happened to be young men, and say, you, you're coming with us. Once the Zetas had taken their prisoners, the bus was then ordered to leave. This horrifying variety of wholesale, seemingly random kidnapping, happened time and time again throughout the entire March of 2011. The families of those that had been taken begged local authorities to act, Almost everyone was aware, Los Zetas were the ones to blame. But not only did authorities have no idea why the Zetas were dragging young men off of buses, they had no idea where they were taking them either. Yet a few weeks later, all of those questions were answered, and the conclusions were nothing short of horrifying. On April 6th of 2011, local authorities were informed that a mass grave had been discovered, just outside the city of San Fernando. A total of 59 sets of human remains were recovered over the days that followed, many of which belonged to those who'd been snatched off of buses in those weeks prior. Two days later, the Secretary General of Tamaulipas announced the discovery of 13 more bodies, bringing the total body count to 72. But unlike the first San Fernando massacre, which had targeted Central American migrants, 
The bodies recovered from the mass graves all belong to Mexican citizens. On April 10th, four additional mass graves were uncovered. Then two days after that, another set of graves were found. This process repeated itself until June 7th of 2011, when a final death toll of 193 was announced. The discovery of so many corpses sent shockwaves throughout Mexican society, and entire news cycles were dedicated to the investigation. But when the truth behind the second San Fernando massacre emerged, it horrified even the most cynical of investigators. On June 11th of 2011, a reporter from the Houston Chronicle named Dane Schiller shared details of an interview that he'd conducted with a supposed Zeta associate. He claimed to know where the kidnapped were being taken, but the truth was, it wasn't Los Zetas that were killing him. They were killing each other. Some said it was Zeta's novel method of recruitment. Others said it was nothing but a sick form of entertainment to the psychopathic cartel members. But after being dragged from their buses and transported to an unknown location, the kidnapped victims were forced into mortal combat with one another. They called it Mexico's next top hitman. The anonymous associate claimed, they give them knives, hammers, machetes, all kinds of things. Then they make them cut each other to pieces. I earn way more money with the Zetas, but I know the kind of evil crap they do. They like to brag about it. The Zetas associate also claimed that on one occasion, one of the unwilling victors to the forced gladrial combat completely lost his mind. The young man became completely detached from reality, didn't seem to believe what was happening was real. The Zetas told him he was dreaming, and in order to wake up, he had to do exactly as they told him. The Zetas then drove the young man towards San Fernando, put a gun in his hand, then pointed him in the direction of the golf cartel checkpoint. The young man walked forward, raised the pistol, and was immediately gunned down by the waiting Sicarios. Another cartel associate, who was arrested in Texas around that same period, claimed the gladiator fights had been arranged on the order of a high-ranking Zeta lieutenant named Miguel Morales. Yet, he also claimed that not all the participants were unwilling. The Zetas had instituted a policy of forced conscription around San Fernando as means of weaponizing the Gulf's own support base against them. But they also accepted many volunteers into the ranks during that time. This meant, for all intent and purpose, a terrified kidnap victim could be forced to fight a highly motivated, highly psychopathic individual who wanted to prove their value to some of the most monstrous men in Mexico. In the aftermath, several Los Cetas lieutenants were apprehended by the police, including the mastermind of the original San Fernando massacre. The Mexican Attorney General offered a reward of 15 million US dollars for information leading to the capture of those responsible and the information that flooded led to the arrest of 82 people thought to be directly and indirectly involved. 16 of those arrested were municipal police officers in San Fernando, and according to investigations, the officers protected Los Zetas and helped them cover up the killings. The fallout proved to be a massive hit to both the Zeta structure and their strategic capabilities, but wounded animals often proved to be the most dangerous. The Grupo Royale company runs the chains of casinos and entertainment venues in Monterey and Los Cabos. During the late summer of 2011, a group of armed Los Cedos men marched into the company's Monterey casino and demanded a percentage of the monthly profits. The manager advised, if they wanted a share of the protection money that the casino paid, they should speak to the cartel. But the Zetas preferred action over dialogue. Just before 2 p.m. on August 25th of 2011, 12 Zeta operatives met for lunch at a restaurant just a few blocks away from Monterey Casino. About an hour later, the Zeta's operatives were spotted at a gas station in the neighborhood of Valley Verde, filling jerry cans with gasoline. The station clerk said they drove off without paying, but was too frightened to call the police. 50 minutes later, a convoy of four vehicles pulled into the parking lot of the Monterey Casino the nine heavily armed Zeta operatives stormed in its front entrance. In the aftermath, some survivors claimed that they're forcing their way into the casino. The Zetas did not target any of its occupants. Instead, 
fired their weapons into the air in order to gain everyone's attention. The operatives then ordered everyone out of the casino before dousing the place with gasoline and setting it ablaze. However, not all of the casino visitors understood what was going on. Upon hearing the gunmen announce themselves as representatives of Los Zetas, a huge proportion of the casino occupants assumed a massacre was about to take place. They didn't wait around to hear what the gunmen had to say. They simply ran off to find emergency exits and suitable hiding places. It's believed around 150 people attempted to hide themselves throughout the casino complex. But when they realized the Zetas had merely set the place on fire before withdrawing, panic surged and the people stampeded. Around 100 of them made it out alive. But as the Monterey Fire Department doused the flames and began attempting to rescue those trapped inside, they discovered 52 asphyxiated corpses were strewn around the building. Following a brief investigation, the firefighters announced that the casino emergency exits had been locked at the time of the raid, suggesting not only inside involvement, but also that the Zetas did indeed intend to inflict civilian casualties. In the span of just 190 seconds, the Zetas had inflicted a major blow to the Gulf Cartel's funding, as well as dooming 52 innocent people to death. Although the war between Los Zetas and the Gulf Cartel had been waging for months, the Monterey Casino attack was the first time the conflict drew the attention of international media. US President Barack Obama called the attack brutal and reprehensible, while Secretary General Ba Ki Moon called it a deplorable act of violence. Global human rights charity Amnesty International demanded a detailed investigation of the incident and declared their solidarity with the families of the victims. The situation in Tamaulipas had become a source of immense embarrassment for the Mexican government, both internationally and domestically. So to re-establish trust between the states and the people that they were bound to serve, the president ordered a surge in regional counter-narcotics operations. In May of 2011, a battalion-sized task force of around 650 men, comprised mostly of Mexican Marines and Special Forces, was sent to Tamaulipas to combat the drug cartels. The task force was supported by police, military reservists, and civilian volunteers, and focused not only on physically combating Zetas and cartel gunmen, but also winning the hearts and minds of local civilians by providing them with health care, reconstruction services, and even free haircuts. Yet the only thing holding the project back was the one institution's job it was to advance their cause. Police corruption in Tamaulipas was so endemic that in November of 2011, the municipal government essentially suspended the entire force and allowed the Mexican Marine Corps to step in and enforce the law. Only then could the cleanup operation in Tamaulipas really gain any traction, but once it did, the Zeta's downfall was inevitable. By the beginning of 2012, the Los Zetas were no longer the same elite fighting force that had gone to war with the Gulf Cartel two years earlier. The quality of their leadership, manpower, and equipment had been seriously degraded, not only by the resistance of the cartels and their allies, but also by the continual operations of the Mexican Marines. Throughout 2012, Marines constructed four additional operational bases in the state of Tamaulipas and they brought the hammer down on Los Zetas wherever they found them. On October 9th, the Mexican Navy confirmed that the Zeta Supreme Leader had been killed in a firefight with Mexican Marines near the Texan border. Lascano, who had been the call sign Zeta 3, meaning he was one of the group's founding members, his death was a huge blow to the organization's morale, as well as its effectiveness. The following year, a number of the other Zeta lieutenants were apprehended or killed, and several of their armories were captured by the Marines. By the end of 2014, international crisis group researcher Daniel Herring stated the Los Zetas were on their way out. The old networks have been disrupted, and the Zetas have been splintered, Herring said. There are now a series of smaller factions, with the primary competitors for power being the Hell Squadron the old school Zetas, and the Cartel del Norte. The rise of the Zetas may have been followed by their abrupt downfall, but their influence on the Mexican narco culture has been indelible. 
Back in the 90s, the cartels hadn't stooped for the kind of savagery they engage in today. Instead, they used what could be referred to as codes of murder. For example, a bullet through the back of the head marked a dead man as a traitor, while a bullet through the temple made it clear they'd been executed by a rival gang or cartel. Many believe the first incident of cartel barbarism occurred in September of 2006, when Sicarios of La Familia Micho Akana threw severed heads onto the dance floor of a Michoacan nightclub. But in reality, this incident was merely the first to receive international attention, and the practice of beheading one's enemy was introduced many years earlier. As we've already discussed, the Zetas spent their first few years recruiting only former and serving Special Forces operators. But recruitment was not only confined to those of Mexican birth. Los Zetas extended their reach into Guatemala inside the late 90s. They found rich pickings among a group known as the Cabeles. The Cabeles are Guatemala's equivalent of the Green Berets. They specialize in counterinsurgency operations and jungle warfare tactics and endure training which pushes recruits to mental and physical extremes. Those who earn the right to sleep are permitted to do so for only three hours, and before recruits are permitted to eat, they must run two miles in 18 minutes or less while wearing full combat gear. Recruits are then given exactly 30 seconds to eat before their food trays are taken away from them. During the final stages of training, recruits are flown deep into the jungle in the middle of the night forced out of the helicopter wearing nothing but their underwear, then given 24 hours to find their way back to base. Those who fail are forced to repeat the exercise over and over again until they either succeed or quit. But the Cabeles aren't just famous for their rigorous style of training, they're also famous for near limitless cruelty. Although the practice has since been banned among its recruits, its old ritual of the Cabeles was to give their recruits a chicken to take care of throughout their entire eight-week training course. These chickens were kept in a coop not far from the recruits' barracks, who were charged with feeding them, cleaning their coop, and most importantly, naming them. Towards the end of their training, the recruits were told to go out to the coop and collect their beloved chickens for inspection. Then one by one, the recruits were told to take tight hold of their feathered friends and bite their heads off. The chickens are then fed to the recruits as their first fresh meat in almost two months. As you can imagine, this kind of training breeds soldiers capable of unspeakable acts of cold-blooded savagery. But that's exactly what their recruiters were looking for. The Guatemalan Cabeles brought many of their traditions to the Zetas, but one of them was ritual beheading. Having their teeth cut during the Guatemalan Civil War, the Cabeles struck fear into the hearts of their enemies by displaying the decapitated heads of those they'd killed on operations. However, these heads wouldn't be displayed as trophies back at their bases. They'd be strewn over some prominent landmark in their enemy's heartland, as a warning. Being in the business of brutal intimidation, the Zetas adopted the Cabeles' tactics, and from the early 2000s onward, grisly executions, such as beheadings, flaying, became even more commonplace. Every other cartel in Mexico was forced to adopt similar tactics in order to keep up with the Zetas' meteoric rise to power, such as the Jalisco New Generation Cartel, who in September of 2011, dumped over 30 bodies into a busy avenue on the state of Veracruz. What we're seeing in Mexico is a process of paramilitarism, in which different groups seek to wipe out their rivals, said Mexican organized crime expert Edgardo Basquilla shortly after the Veracruz bodies were discovered. But without a shadow of a doubt, the organization which started this process of militarization was Los Zetas. The story of Los Zetas comes down to, in the course of a decade, 13 disgruntled Special Forces soldiers rose to become the second most powerful narcotics traffickers in North America. They applied their elite, martial mentality to the most lucrative black market on the face of the earth. And in doing so, made the world a considerably more frightening place. Yet the original 13 Zetas didn't just become multimillionaires by killing hundreds, if not thousands of innocent people. They've made an indelible mark on the contemporary culture. From the beheading of Danny Trejo's character in Breaking Bad, to the fully militarized cartel enemies in the latest Call of Duty games, 
the Zetas have made their mark on society and changed the geopolitical landscape of the United States border territories forever. Hey everyone, thanks for listening if you stuck around to this point. If you haven't yet, please hit the like button, the subscribe button, and that notification bell to be notified when future episodes come out. If you have a true scary story of your own, feel free to send it to my email or post it to my subreddit. You can stalk me on Twitter, you can stalk me on Facebook, and you can also stalk me on Instagram. All these links are below. Hey, what's up everybody? Um, This episode was supposed to be just break-in stories, but I also had those cartel stories, and you know what? I meant to do it on Sunday, but it didn't happen, so I figured break-ins and cartels are not the same topics, but they're similar and close enough, and also I appreciate anybody's patience with me pronouncing and mispronouncing anything and everything within that cartel story episode. That was a wild story, and it's all true. Um, and it's all out there for you to go look up and check out if you want to delve into it for yourself because some of the stuff that happened was completely effed. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, it goes way deeper than even that. And uh, Sam, who who wrote all that for me, that script up for me, he did a, a fantastic job per usual and delved real deep into it. But there's videos out there. There's more stories you can look into. But it's a uh, it's a wild story. Let alone um, yeah. But so I hope you. <laughs> I hope you appreciate that and uh, enjoyed this episode for what it is. Sorry, I kind of molded two episodes together, but I figured you weren't going to be more upset or be upset with about 30, 30 more minutes of content or whatever. So um, I think camping and hiking stories are going to be next or uh, middle of nowhere. Uh, one of the two, not really sure yet, and then probably get some Valentine's Day stories in after that. So be on the lookout for those for the rest of the week. And um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. I got to go fold some laundry. So I'll, uh, I'll see you in the next one, guys. Cheers. Cheers.